Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Gary Matsuoka and this is Laguna Hills Nursery. And today's class topic is going to be on growing plums, pluots, and pluries. Now, in the trade, generally pl plums in general are kind of unpredictable compared to the other stone fruits. So, we're talking peaches, nectarines. If you get the right weather and you treat them properly, you get a crop. Plums, sometimes everything's right and they still don't perform well. So they're a little more mysterious than the other fruit. But uh, at least in my own taste buds, I like, you know, plums were originally my favorite fruit as a kid. So I love to grow plums. I've grown many, many kinds. Uh, they do respond to a winter chill. So we need a definite winter or a cool period for them to produce. Now, if you're not familiar with what chill means, <clears throat> so it's called a minimum chill requirement. And it's not the soil, it's not the branches, it's actually the flower and leaf buds on the very, on all the branches individually they have to receive a certain amount of cool weather in order to finish proper development and then bloom make leaves make fruit all that and the temperatures that we're working with <clears throat> there's more than one model that that research have created but the one that we follow we think is correct means that you've got to have so many hours between 34 degrees and 55 degrees Fahrenheit it's not constant. You don't get one hour at 34 degrees. You don't get one hour for every hour you spend at 55. It's, and you get more than one hour, apparently, if you're at around 44 degrees. So it's, it's a curve. Uh, don't get anything below 34. Don't get much below 50, above 55. So it's always a guess. I think there's some computers out there that have the, the calculus set up in them so where they can figure it out pretty good but still uh, we're guessing because unless you put a tree inside a environmental con uh, climate controlled greenhouse there's no way you know for sure and I don't think they've done that many trees in greenhouse thereby just watches what the trees do uh, and calculates what the minimum chill is and we're guessing we're always guessing what it is and in fact uh, we think it takes like 10 years for us to figure out exactly what the chill is and sometimes we still get surprised. So um, in Orange County you can say the average should be around 300 hours for the winter period. Now the winter period we consider anything from about mid-November to late March and the earlier you get that cold seems to be more the trees seem to be more productive. If you can get all your cold before February then it's great but we've had some years where we didn't, like two years ago, we didn't get any cold until March. March was the only cold we had, and a lot of trees did quite well. We were amazed that year that they responded to that late a chill. But uh, this year we got, we've gotten 200 hours at least at this point. We're gonna lose some in the next week with the 80 degree temperatures that they're predicting. I don't know if we'll get there or not. Uh, and then hopefully, we, because we've got still have two months of winter left, that we'll be able to capture that and, and get going again. So you, you get chill between these temperatures. You kind of lose chill if you're above 60. I don't know if you lose, I don't think you lose chill if you go too cold. <clears throat> and in Orange County also, there's flat areas, and the flat areas tend to get about 300, maybe a little more than 300 hours. But there's also hills, and there's also riverbeds. <clears throat> now the canyons, especially in inland Orange County, or even Laguna Canyon Road, if you've been that, down that narrow canyon there, the canyons usually pick up a lot more chill. The cold air forms at altitude, and it drops. And generally, the cold canyons in Orange County are the, get the most chill in the area. Um, one of our customers lives in Tribuca Canyon. They said they've already hit 20 degrees. So 
so it really gets cold. That cold air just gets trapped in those little canyons, and they get a lot of chill there. The big rivers, like Sand River, San Juan Creek, drain the cold air from the hills to the ocean. So anyone who lives near the big rivers in Orange County, or even just a drainage ditch, gets a decent amount of chill, more than 300 hours. Uh, we have a friend who lives right along block off of the Santa Ana River. He can grow in just about any plum he wants to right there. Any pear, uh, there's a lot of things that need to chill and he can grow them. I, I'm just amazed. So, you know, they, a lot of the chill hours in the book are wrong because they're getting reports from people who live along the big rivers and they're growing everything. So they think that these, a lot of fruit trees don't need much chill because they're here and they're fruiting really well, but they're not taking into account the real microclimates that exist. So if you are at the bottom of a hill in a canyon, you get a lot of chill. If you're on the sides of a hill or the top of a hill, you get the least amount of chill in the area. So generally, the hillsides of Orange County grow papayas, avocados, mangoes, all the tropical stuff you grow on the hillsides near the top especially, and the stone fruit and pears, which require the chill, and some of the nut trees uh, in the low spots, or the, at least the flat ground areas of Orange County. Now, there are some, a few th stone fruits that don't need much chill, you know, 200 hours, and they're fine on the hills. But if you need 300 hours plus, it's nice, you get much better results, more consistent results if you're on flat ground now. The chill varies widely, so we've had some years where even the hilltops were getting 400, 500 hours. But uh, lately it's been very light chills or uh, low hours of chills accumulating on the hills. Uh, flat valley areas or flat ground areas have done okay. This last year we got right around 300 hours. This year we're hoping for more. and. Uh, and if, you haven't, if you've lived here a long time and you've watched the temperatures uh, in the wintertime, you know that we have, it goes back and forth. So the early 80s were like 2014 to 2018, very, very warm winters. And we couldn't get any plums to do anything. We were throwing plum trees away because they wouldn't wake up. And without the chill, they just, they just don't have any reason to wake up in the spring. And then the late 80s were the coldest winters I've ever recorded. Uh, averaged probably 400, 500 hours for about five years there. And then it moderated, 1990s, two th early 2000s were about 300 hours of chill, 300, 350. And then we got to this real low chill time again in the, uh, just five years ago. Now it seems we're going back into a cooler mode. So we'll see how that goes. So. If it says 300 hours or less, you're good, but not many plums and pluots and pluries we're talking about need that little amount of chill. There's a few, but uh, most of them need 300 hours plus. So now in your own yard, if you have a house, north side, south side, in the wintertime, the sun's angle is such that you get a lot of shade on the north side of the house, no shade on the south side. In fact, south side, you get radiated heat. So on a house itself, if you plant, say, a plum or a pluot about 10 feet off the north side and keep it short so it stays in the shade all winter, you get additional chill. South side, you get less chill than normal. North side, you get a little bit more. And the nice thing about being a few feet off the north side, in the summertime, the shadow doesn't hit the tree and you can get enough sun to ripen the fruit. So the nice thing about plums, pluries, pluots is most of them ripen in the summer when the sun is the highest. Uh, and you need that sun right when they're ripening the fruit. Within the few weeks of ripening the fruit, you need more sun to get the flavor and the sweetness. So north side, make sure it gets sun in the summer. is not a bad spot if you have a problem with your chill, if you're on a hilltop. The other thing is, if you're on a sloped area, cold air gets trapped behind fences or buildings. You get cold air built up behind those. And that's uh, another spot. Just 
behind a fence or uh, on, the north, on the top side of a fence that's trapping cold air. Okay, so uh, planting-wise, this time here we have the bare roots. We're starting to get a little bit low on some of them. But uh, now when we get bare roots, we like to get them that look like that because that has a nice, fairly good branching structure right off the bat. When orchards plant, they usually buy, now this says half inch caliper. I would say they're, they're a little generous and they're, you know, it looks more like three eighths inch. Uh, so in orchards, they know that they're wasting money if they plant anything more than three eighths inch caliper. Because these tend to grow fine, but they've got no branching. That's generally when they're that small, uh, and they're cheaper for the orchards to plant, they've got no branching. So what they do is when they plant them, they cut them short, forces it to branch low. So they can get the branching starting at a lower height on the tree rather than up here. And when you plant uh, bare root, now roots here, this is the graft where they're grafted. This is the scion or the part that we're looking for. Generally, they're grafted about three inches above the soil level. So the original soil level is right about here. However, you know, we've planted them this shallow, that deep, that's your range. You almost have a foot of range there where you can screw up and it still does okay. Uh, plant roots do not like compost in the ground, so do not uh, use quote, the regular planter mixes that contain compost. Uh, all that should be done on top of the ground, not in the ground with the roots. It'll rot the roots out. That compost causes a lot of root suffocation. Now when you're planting bare roots, uh, you know, you don't really want to trim your roots unless you see something broken or cracked. I do see a few, you know, you shake this, you go, oh, this one's real wobbly, so it's broken right there, so we'll cut it off right where it's broken. That one's cracked too, so we'll cut that one off. And this one's split pretty badly, so I'm going to cut off the split area so that there's not a big open wound on it. And we should be okay this way. Now, in the old days when we had bare roots, you know, we had, generally we did have just a fishing pole for a top and a root that looked like a carrot. There wasn't much branching on them. And this is, you know, compared to 20 years ago, this is pretty generous. We like to see more roots than that, but this is pretty generous. Uh, we've lost very few bare root trees with, for not having roots. I mean, I would say all but one of these can break off, and it'll still make it. They, they, they don't seem to suffer that much if you have just a little bit of root on them. With the branching, well, this one's broken. We'll cut that one off. This one will save, but what we'll do with what we do with this one is after we plant it, we'll cut it down right at the point where we want the branching to begin. Otherwise, it might start from the top. You never know where it's going to branch out from. Now, in theory, you can take a branch and curve it like this, and not have to waste it, and it'll, and it'll branch right at the top of that curve. So that's another option you have, but it's generally just easier just to cl to clip it off. And a lot of people will say, well, I don't want to lose the height. Well, the one thing to know about most of the fruit trees we sell bare root is they all grow too big. There's no trouble getting the height. What you want is to keep it short so you can pick it. The height is not a problem. So the ideal size of a fruit tree has been shrinking. So in the orchards, if you go to an orchard, if you were in an orchard, say, 40, 50 years ago, you notice all the trees were pretty good size. So orchard trees used to be trained like this. So 15 to 20 foot across, maybe 12 to 15 foot high, lots of upright stems, open vase shape. So that was the, you know, back in the 40s and 50s, this was the method of choice. Nowadays, we're looking more at fruit trees that are maybe, well, they, according to the research, the 
most production in an orchard per square foot is on, a, if your fruit trees are about five foot wide and perhaps 10 foot tall. And for most homeowners, I would say eight foot is better so you can reach all the fruit and in that shape. So what they found is that on most fruit trees, if they're this form, you get a shell, the, the sunlight really doesn't get through more than they say about 30 inches of foliage. So in other words, you'll get a shell of fruit production that looks like this. And you have a big empty spot in there. So you're wasting a lot of space. Uh, with the fruit tree five foot wide and that, the entire thing's in production. You have to spend more money up front, plant more fruit trees, maybe eight times more, nine times more fruit trees on your property, but then you get a lot more fruit for that effort. The nice thing for homeowners is you can plant more fruit trees in your yard. You know, every, every six feet you can put another fruit tree, keep it five foot wide, and have uh, more different varieties ripen at different times. Because if you have a tree this big, and I've, I, my first plum tree was this size, it's about 400, 500 pieces of fruit, and you have two weeks to do something with that fruit. So generally a lot of it ends up on the ground, spoiled. Uh, fruit tree this size, this is maybe 50 to 100 fruit here. And generally a, fam a, good, a family of four, five, you can eat a lot of that, more, at least half of that. Yeah. So uh, this, is, this is ideal. Now there's different ways you can do multiple fruit trees too now. We don't generally get plums or pluots, multi-grafted trees. They make them. Uh, the problem with them is there's not many plums or pluots that do well here, so you have to choose them very carefully, and usually the multi-grafted ones don't have the right ones for us. So uh, we tell you to get separate trees, and if you wanted to really save room, you can grow them as one tree. So you can say, 